This episode of Shaun of the South is brought to you by Case Knives, one of America's foremost manufacturers of premium knives. Case Knives have been treasured items that have been passed down to my family for generations. So put down the phone, shut off the TV, and go out and get your hands dirty and build something. Keep your hands sharp with a Case Knife. Hey, you are listening to Sean of the South, and I'm your host tonight, Sean Dietrich. And man, we've got a great show lined up for you coming to you live via the podcast airwaves and the radios all over the nation. This group of fine looking young women behind me on the stage fixing to play music for you here tonight is the Price Sisters, everybody. The Price Sisters. program is brought to you by Visit North Alabama, the Mountain Lakes Tourist Association travel to visit the 16 North Alabama counties that make this state what it is, festivals, attractions, and restaurants all over Alabama. Bunt County, Cherokee County, Colbert County, Coleman County, DeKalb County, Edwell County, Franklin County, Jackson County, Lauderdale County, Lawrence County, Limestone County, Madison County, Marion County, Marshall County, Morgan County, Winston County. <laughs> Or visit the Horton Mill Bridge just off Alabama 75, about five miles north. Lonnie built in 1935. All the work was done strictly by hand tools. Think about that for a second. Or how about the North Alabama Barbecue Trail trek across North Alabama on a holy, sacred pilgrimage of saturated fat and slow smoked pork. Other states do their barbecue differently than they do in Alabama, and that's not to say that they don't do it right. That is absolutely to say that they do it dead wrong. <laughs> Visit North Alabama today because whatever you want to do, you can do it better in North Alabama. Look them up at Visit North Alabama or NorthAlabama.org or hashtag Visit North AL. We're going to have another tune here from the Price Sisters, everybody. The Price Sisters. <laughs>
Curry a little bit of our mail, a little bit of our mail tonight sent in to us from listeners all over this nation who had nothing better to do than to put a few sentiments down on either paper or via email or people telling us how much they absolutely despise us <laughs> or people who are trapped in nursing homes who are forced to listen to the radio who cannot reach the dial <laughs> because they are disabled. Our first letter comes from James, Blackshear, Georgia. Dear Sean, I've been enjoying your writing and shows for a while now, and a good friend of mine turned me on to your work, and since we both are dog lovers, I thought I'd share this with you. My brother, who lived next door at the time, brought a little beagle puppy home for his two boys, and he hollered for me and them to come see what he got, and I will never forget what happened. The five-year-old squealed, oh my gosh, it's a basket hound. And his brother, who was seven, who was much older and wiser, said, it ain't neither, it's a bagel. <laughs> and we laughed about this for years and years. Anyhow, I love your stuff. Keep it up, your bud, James. Melanie Grimes, Lexington, Massachusetts. It's a long story how I found you, but I like your work. My boyfriend and I were driving to Canada and we were going to see his relatives. And I got to thinking about how cultures make us who we are. And when I met his parents, this was really driven home because it was the first time I met his parents and I noticed how funny they talked. You see, they are originally from Scotland and they say everything very, very differently than I do. And I got to thinking about how in the US, it's the same way as it is all over the world. We have lots of different cultures that make us different, but unique and special. You got the South, the North, the West Coast, and the Miami Latino population, and the folks on the East Coast who think everything has to be done in a hurry. Anyway, I know I'm rambling, but thanks for the podcast. Dear Melanie, you got it. Jennifer Durhurst, Huntsville, Alabama. I'm sending a message to my sister Allison in Irondale, Georgia, who's turning 40 years old today. She's an impressive woman. She makes her two boys listen to your show before they go to bed sometimes because you put them right to sleep in only a few seconds. And Charlotte, I wish I were kidding about that, but I'm not. 40 is a big year, and I wish I were there to be with her to help her celebrate, but we all have so many family obligations that it's nearly impossible this year. So this will have to do. Love you, Allison. Love you so, so very much. Russell Davis, Calhoun, Georgia. Don't know if you remember us, Sean, up here or not, but your wife cooked us a fabulous meal out of, out of our kitchen once, and you were here for a book signing for a mutual friend long, long ago. Anyway, my wife Larissa and I will be celebrating our 30th anniversary. That's right, our 30th in February. And I love for you to tell her that I love her more now than I ever have. She makes me the man that I am. I really enjoy your show. I'd love to see you somewhere in the Georgia or North Alabama area. Anyway, thanks for doing what you do. Well, dear Larissa, from everybody here tonight, I'd like to wish you and Russell a happy 30th anniversary. <laughs> many, many more anniversaries between you and yours. This next letter is from Betsy Fisher in Tallahassee, Florida. Sean, I live in Tallahassee. Your descriptions of being lost have really, really hit home for me. Being lost and looking for an identity and being uncertain about life and loss, these things have touched me when you talk about them. I'm a single woman who adopted a child from the foster care when, I, when he was 13. Not even a year later, my amazing son was diagnosed with osteosarcoma bone cancer. For four years, we battled traveling to hospitals like Shands and St. Jude. And well, my son lost his right leg to cancer as well. But he never complained, never. And he stayed busy 
and he loved me and we built an incredible, incredible bond. Sadly, Sean, last May, my son Marshall died. It was only months before he turned 18. I've been struggling ever since. I'm a teacher on a leave of absence and I'm different now. Experiences and love and loss have changed me. I don't know where to be or where I should be or what I should be doing with my life. I love to write and I love to help people and I believe the possibility that God will put his hand down in here at some point and guide me. Maybe he already is. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. I appreciate your honest and vulnerability. Sincerely, Betsy Fisher. Dear Betsy, dear Betsy, thank you for that letter and may you find peace. Holly Sarabia, Athens, Alabama. Uh, before I read this any further, I was supposed to read this a few days ago when I was in Athens, Alabama, but because I had the IQ of a lukewarm lump of coleslaw, I did not read mail or messages when I was in Athens, Alabama, and thus Holly, who was in the audience at the time, probably spent the entire night scratching her head waiting for me to mention her message, which I most certainly did not because, like I said, you know, the coleslaw. <laughs> I botched this, and here it is, though, Holly. If you happen to be listening to this, here it is for you now. Dear Sean, my mama's birthday is January 14th. Her name is Carrie. We will be at your show on January 17th at Athens State University. Lord, forgive me. If you could wish her a belated birthday from the stage, that would be amazing. Maybe it'll make up for the terrible gift I got her myself, but it won't compare to everything she has done for me or will continue to do for me. Signed, your faithful listener and Instagram follower, Holly Sarabia. Well, first, dear Holly, I'm really sorry that I'm hitting this uh, uh, too late. And dear Holly's mama, Carrie, wherever you are, happy birthday, happy birthday from everybody here tonight. And I'm sorry about forgetting you when you were in my audience. Myron Weiser, Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. Sean, I got a new pair of earphones from my daughter. They hook up to my TV and I can watch all sorts of things without bothering anybody in the apartments below me or above me. I am practically deaf at my age, but now I feel like I'm giving a second chance at life and I just want to tell my daughter, Jeremy, who bought these earphones for me, thank you, I love them, I can even listen to podcasts like I'm doing right now. Anyway, I don't know all the fancy internet jargon that you're supposed to use, but I think they're called podcasts, and I was hoping you'd read this on your podcast. Have a good day. The Lord be with you, Myron. Dear Myron, and also with you, you must be Episcopalian. <laughs> Philip Kent, Bryant, Arkansas. John, it's cold in Arkansas. I'm about to die from the weather. My son, though, is 14, and he runs around in shorts with no problem. No problem. I'm right to tell you that I've just enrolled in college, even though I'm 43 years old, and I'm terrified. I really am. But I'm going to finish my bachelor's degree. I've tried one time before, but life got in the way. I'm sure you understand because I've heard parts of your story. But this time I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I just wanted to share that with you. I don't know why. Wherever you are, stay warm. Your buddy Phil. Dear Phil, good luck to your brother. And you stay warm too. Scotty Rowling, Eudora, Kansas. Sean, I was a minister who had a rough year that I'd rather not talk about. But what I will tell you is I stepped down from my congregation and I resigned from my denomination. But I want to tell you that I have doubted a lot of things this past year. A lot of things that I thought I really knew firmly. I've doubted just about everything. And even though I used to be the kind of man who never doubted a single thing, 
I'm no longer the doubt-free person I was. I am weak and I'm humble. But the reason I'm writing to you is to tell you that I have learned one thing at the beginning stretch of this long road I'm on and there is something that I want to share with you and your listeners if they want to hear it. Something comes down from the sky, from heaven, that can only be called love. And it is there. It's not hard to see. You just have to go looking for it sometimes. And I just wanted your listeners to know, since I listen to your show every week, that whatever it is you face, there is love out there. It's everywhere. It's up, it's down, it's in the dirt, it's in the people you know, and it's right now, right here. And in my life, it's all I have. Thank you for reading this in advance. Signed, Scotty. Dear Scotty, I don't believe anybody could have said it any better. I have no life but this, to lead it here, nor any death but lest dispelled from there. Nor ties to earth to come, nor action new, except through this extent, the realm of you, the great Emily Dickinson. Translation, well, I'm sorry, I have no earthly idea what she said, but I always thought it was a very nice point. So I hope it lets you know, Scotty, that we're all here thinking about you tonight. And that's letters from our listeners. We're going to have another two here from the Posh Sisters, everybody. The Posh Sisters.
I want to tell you, that fried chicken we just had back there in that little fellowship hall just a few minutes ago was some of the best eating I've had in about a hundred years. Let's give these ladies a hand and put on that spread for everybody here tonight. Come on, give them a hand. I like to consider myself a little bit of an expert on fried chicken. I've had extensive experience with it. Uh, I've had extensive experience in tasting different varieties of it. I believe, now I can't prove this, but I'm pretty certain that I can taste a drumstick and I can tell you which denomination <laughs> the church lady who made it comes from. I'm serious, I'm serious. I know that the Methodists make their drumsticks in a very interesting way. They use a thin batter, usually it's not too thick. It's a kind of thin and they place it into a skillet with oil that only comes up about mid drumstick. <laughs> and then they turn it and they flip it over. Now that's a little bit different in the Southern Baptist way. The Southern Baptist way is we, we take the drumstick, we batter fry it, we, or we batter it, and then we batter it again until the batter is so thick that it gives your cardiologist trust issues. <laughs> and then they place it into so much painted oil, the thing ought to be illegal for U.S. consumption. <laughs> Once you eat one bite of this drumstick made by a Southern Baptist woman, your first bite is 80% batter and 20% chicken and 100% oil. Yes, sir, I know this chicken like the back of my hand. We never approached a fellowship hall during my childhood without having a casserole dish full of fried chicken in our arms. My mother always brought fried chicken to the potlucks on Wednesday nights in that old fellowship hall. I can still see that place in my mind. I believed as a child that this fried chicken was our token, was our, was our offering, that you had to approach our holy place with an offering in your hands, just like the old time Israelites did when they sacrificed animals. Uh, what more is fried chicken than a sacrificed animal? I thought that chickens were evangelical birds <laughs> placed onto earth for the forgiveness of sins. I believed this with all my heart ever since Sunday school when the teacher was telling us about the Israelites who would sacrifice a lamb during Passover. And then they would rub the blood of that lamb all over their door jam and they would cook up that lamb for supper and they would eat lamb together. And that was their, that was their Seder, their Passover meal. Well, my cousin Ellie was in class when she was explaining this, and when she finished her story, she said, can anybody in class tell me why we don't need to sacrifice lambs anymore? My cousin Ellie raised his hand. He said, yes, ma'am, because we have Miss Carolyn Williams to fry chicken for us. <laughs> and of course, I believed this. I believed that fried chicken was a Baptist bird. I went over to my friend's house one night for supper. My friend was from Mobile, Alabama. He came from a Catholic family. They went to a Catholic church. And for supper that night, they ate strange things I had never had before. Strange things. His mother brought out white bunny bread and country crock margarine and they, they would spread this stuff on that white bread and eat it just plain like, like that. It was, just, it was the strangest thing. There were no biscuits. There were no biscuits. I, I came to realize that Catholics might not eat biscuits. And it's no wonder that they have the Pope because they need somebody to fill the void that biscuits have left. And they, they, they served that night. His mother served chicken breasts which had been broiled in the oven and they had pineapples on top and maraschino cherries on top. And I looked at this thing. I said to my friend, what is this? He said, why, it's chicken. Ain't you never had chicken? I looked at it and I said, yeah, I've had chicken, but, but we fry our chicken. He said, oh, no, 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 we're Catholic. We don't do that. I looked at this thing and I tried to cut it with the steak knife provided 
This thing was so tough, you could have used it to scrub oil stains off the driveway. <laughs> it was hard and dry, and I ate it, and it took me at least 100 bites to get one swallowed down, and I had to chase it with a little bit of water. And in order to sop the gravy that was on my plate, and there wasn't much of it, and a lot of it was pineapple flavored, I had to use a piece of bunny bread instead of a biscuit or a yeast roll. It was, it was an atrocity. <laughs> so I took it upon myself to introduce my friend to a different style of living. I invited him to church one Wednesday night, and he agreed to come with me. And when we came to the church, I was carrying that casserole dish of fried chicken that my mother had made. He was walking beside me. We got into that fellowship hall. It's like any fellowship hall you've seen in your entire life. Fellowship hall was lined with 80 people who all dressed alike, women with tall beehive hairdos and cat-rimmed glasses, and they all smelled like the Estee Lauder's youth do. <laughs> Women wore pearls and flat shoes because we're modest people. And women did not wear high heels. They did not wear high heels because it made them too attractive. And Christians do not believe in being too attractive. We were not showy people. We did not believe in putting paprika on our deviled eggs. <laughs> but we had food that could convert even the most depraved and heartless sinner and bring him back from the edge of hell and make him repent from his vile wickedness and all of his base living out in the secular world, which ultimately leads to dancing. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. We brought that food in. We laid it on that, on that offering potluck table. And the pastor blessed it in that agitated voice that he uses. He paced up and down. He prayed in that, that almost angry voice that he would use. Baptists have been using this since the beginning of time. They pray like they're ticked off for Jesus. <laughs> and they pray this prayer over the food until it's ready. And then all 80 saints gather and they stack their clamshell paper plates so full that it is a violation of the American Heart Association. <laughs> yes. The last potluck I went to just recently, last potluck I went to, uh, Miss Liddy had made the fried chicken. Pastor Wallace was going to the line. He was first above everybody. And he was stacking up all sorts of casseroles onto his plate next to his chicken. And at, at, right after the meal was over, Miss Lydia announced that she had lost a diamond in her wedding ring. While she was making the squash casserole, she was grating the cheese to go on the casserole. And she was rubbing her, her knuckles against that grater. And she realized she'd lost her diamond. And so, everybody's meal was almost gone. So all 80 saints of God were digging through their plates looking for this diamond, but nobody found it until the first thing next morning when Pastor Wallace found it while he was reading the paper on the toilet. <laughs> Potlucks are glorious events. My friend and I walked through that potluck line as boys holding our clamshell plates, and I went to the fried chicken first, and I said, listen here. I have two instructions for you. Take two pieces, one drumstick and one short thigh, put it on your plate, and eat it with both hands. And don't say a word. So we did. We walked over to a table. There were Baptist men and women gathered around this table. The Baptist men were wearing white polyester suits with the Sansa belt pants. Sansa belt is just a big old flap that rolls across your waist and buttons, so eliminating the need for a belt, it will make you look a little bit heavier, but it is quite functional. And the men were wearing white patent leather shoes, and the women, they had their tall hair. The taller the hair, the closer you are to God. And they were, the women were getting ready to eat their fried chicken, so they removed their earrings first and placed them on the table. And my friend took one bite of his drumstick, and I looked into his eyes, and I saw the light of salvation come on inside him. <laughs> Today, my friend is a Baptist minister. <laughs> and like all Baptist ministers who are worth their salt, he has a 42-inch waist. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, sir. This is the glory of the Baptist potluck. All good things happened beneath that same roof. They were all equal to me. Church was no different than a potluck. Communion around a table was no different than communion eating our saltine crackers and thimble full of grape juice. Me washing dishes with my mother in the back sink of the little tiny fellowship hall kitchen was no different than memorizing the Beatitudes. And me helping my father unfold chairs and stack them around them round tables in that fellowship hall was no different than learning how to turn the other cheek or learning how to stay awake during a sermon. <laughs> I can remember when my Uncle Jether fell asleep during a sermon once. This is a very, very uh, common thing in the Baptist church because we Baptists sometimes tend to get a little bit bogged down in the boring. And, and it's easy to fall asleep, especially if you're like my Uncle Jether and you've been up that previous night and your breath smells like the night before. <laughs> Uncle Jether fell asleep and he was, he, he had what would later be identified in his life as sleep apnea. And he was beginning to snore a little bit. He was making a sound that sounded like a, like a nitroglycerin truck about to collide with a 747 on the tarmac. And the pastor looked at him when, his, when the crescendo of Uncle Jether's snoring got so loud he couldn't tolerate it anymore. And the pastor was getting agitated and he walked down and he paced that aisle, that wooden aisle of that church. And he stopped right in front of Uncle Jether and he bent down low and he looked at him. And he went shh to the rest of the crowd. And the pastor, because he went to Southern Baptist Seminary, he looked Uncle Jether right in the eye and he said, will all God's saints who know they're going to hell and everlasting fire stand to their feet? <laughs> and Uncle Jether, because he was raised Southern Baptist, who knows, he knows even in the throes of hard REM sleep, he heard the words stand up and Uncle Jether rose to his feet. He was the only man in that entire congregation standing completely erect. And the pastor looked at him with a smirk on his face and his arms folded and the people began to giggle a little bit. The pastor said, do you know why you're standing? Uncle Jether was kind of tired and rubbed his eyes and he started to mumble. He said, well, I don't reckon I know, but whatever it is we're voting for, pastor, you and I are the only ones who are for it. But we have at the end of every boring sermon, especially on a Wednesday night, especially when the pastor is so pressed for hard material to come up with to preach on that he turns that mic over to people and gives the open mic testimony night. Let me tell you, if you've ever wanted to know what it feels like to be trapped in the fires of hell, go to a testimony service. People love to hear the sounds of their own voices in the Baptist tradition. They will step up to that stage, they will take that microphone, and they will, they will proceed to read an entire term paper about their life to you. And it has no discernible point within that entire speech. They will talk on for about one hour and 35 minutes telling you about their third divorce. And you are pressed with no other choice but to listen to it. And the only joy you have set before you after this testimony service on a Wednesday night is the pot luck. You will go into that fellowship hall and you will feel drained and exhausted from hearing Brother Andrew tell you about why his wife demanded that he pay so much in alimony. And you will go to that potluck table weary and burdened down and you will get yourself one of them clamshell plates and you will reach onto that casserole dish and find my mother's fried chicken and you will place it onto your clamshell plate and then you will load yourself up with cheese casserole, cheese and squash casserole, cheese and potato casserole. Cheese and potato rice casserole. Cheese and potato rice and mushroom casserole. Cheese, 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 and cheese casserole. And you will walk to your table and you will sit next to the man who's wearing the polyester suit. And you will sit next to the woman with the 10 foot tall beehive hairdo who wears the long denim dresses and the flat shoes because wearing high heels is lewd and lascivious. 
We are people who do not believe in premarital relations because it very well might one day lead to dancing. <laughs> and you will sit next to them and you will eat this food and something will happen inside you. Your strength will be restored and the light will come on in your eyes and you will start to smile and you'll use words that Southern Baptists have been using since the beginning of time even though you were probably raised as a Methodist like the woman who once joined our church. Pastor Wallace said, ma'am, why are you a Methodist? She said, well, I come from Methodists. You see, my mother was a Methodist. My father was a Methodist. My grandfather was a Methodist. My great-great-grandfather was a Methodist. Pastor Wallace just kind of looked at her with a knowing smile. He said, ma'am, can I share something with you? If your ancestors were morons, if your mother was a moron and your father was a moron, what would that make you? Hmm? And she looked at him and she smiled. She said, well, I do see your point. I guess that would make us Baptist. But they come into our church and they eat our saturated fat and they feel something happen inside them just like I felt happen inside me not very long ago. And once you've crammed your mouth so full of food, you go back from more. And once you've crammed it full of seconds and thirds and fourths, the church ladies are coming around and they're encouraging you to go up and get you some of the pound cake before it disappears. And you will walk up and you will see that pound cake and it will touch you in a core of your being and it will make you understand things about the heavens that you didn't know you really wanted to understand and you will smile and then people will start to sing they will start to sing some glad morning when this life is over I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore, I fly away. Sing with me if you can. I fly away, oh glory. I fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I fly away. I fly away, oh glory. I fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah. Once you have finished with your experience at that small clapboard church with the tin roof and the clapboard sides that have been painted white 50,000 times in a row, the church that is weed whacked every Friday and Saturday by the, the team of boys who, who is on a football team and decided to donate their time for free to keep the yard trim in the Baptist church. Once you have had a conversation in the parking lot that lasts all the way until the sun is starting to go down, even though you are arrived at church at about 8 a.m. in the morning to help arrange the flyers and help pick up the sanctuary and help organize a different committee because we have committees in the Baptist church. Actually, in order to form committees, we have committees to form the committees. And once you have been in this service for just a little while, all of your differences begin to melt away and all of your, your anxieties about this world and about life, they begin to fade like sugar in a rainstorm until they've drained completely from your body and you approach this world with nothing but happiness and joy and grace. At least that's the way that I wish it would be. But I know that I know, that I know, that fried chicken is the answer to all of the world's problems. Hey, thank you very much for having me this evening. It's been a wonderful pleasure. I hope you love and happiness this year. Thank you very much.
Uh, thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I'm your host today, Sean Dietrich. And man, it's been a bona fide pleasure, if I do say so myself. This episode was brought to you by Case Knives, a tradition of my family dating back to my granddaddy, who once said the only way to cure idle hands was to build something. So keep your hands sharp with the Case Knife and Folklore Brewing Company, quite literally the best brew in Alabama. Two gold medals at the Craft Beer Competition of Alabama. Visit FolkloreBrewingMeadry.com. That music you heard behind me today was the Price Sisters, Virginia-based Rebel Records, most recent recording artist, the Price Sisters, feature Lauren Price on the mandolin and Leanna Price on the fiddle. Lauren and Leanna are 22-year-old twin sisters from Sardis, Ohio, who love to perform the traditional style of bluegrass music. They've been greatly influenced by the sounds of Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys, also Hazel and Alice and the Carter family. They strive to carry on those traditional sounds that you will recognize. Do yourself a favor and visit the Price Sisters. Com. And while you're there, download their new album. I swear, you won't regret it. To find anything more about what I do, you can visit SeanOfTheSouthShow.com and there you can find an archive of all our episodes dating to this episode. And while you're there, hope to take time to drop me a line to me about your birthday announcements, wedding invitations, and birthday parties, and I'll do my best to read them over the air if I can, because I love to do that sort of stuff for my friends. And speaking of friends, friends I always borrow money from a pessimist, because a man like that won't expect it back. Adios.